All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is going to be a an attempt to kind of talk through um, the I and Tao by Martin Buber, um, the first page. Um, I've already read I and Thou like twice through, um, but I noticed today as I was sort of going back again to Buber and, and the I and Thou, I started picking up things that I didn't pick up the first two times. Um, or maybe I had simply forgot about it. But I think it's very important that today what I'm going to try to do is if you know, um, along with me, um, we're going to try to sort of just pay attention to as much detail as we can to Buber's I and Thou on the first page and how much can we extract from the first page itself. Um, because I think there's already a lot to extract just from the first page of I and Thou. There's a lot to unpack. There's a lot to think about um, within the first page. I actually feel like the very first section of I and Thou is perhaps the most ambiguous um, in correspondence to the later sections. I think the later sections, Buber starts explaining himself somewhat, um, but the first section of I and Thou is very ambiguous, um, but there's so much to unpack, and I think there's a reason for that ambiguity. But let's begin. All right, so Buber begins with this sentence. To man, the world is twofold in accordance with his twofold attitude. Now, a lot of people's rebuttal against Buber, and, and this might even have to do with Kaufman, I'm kind of referring to Kaufman in this, is that a lot of people like to look at Buber and say, Buber is imposing a false dichotomy. Um, but if you actually look at this sentence, and I know this is not German in any way, but if you look at the very beginning of the sentence, Buber says, Buber does this interesting move, right? He says this, he says, to man, to man, the world is twofold. In my opinion, you can already hear the subjectivity that Buber is pointing out here, the, the real subjectivity of man, right? He's saying two men. He's not actually saying, and I, and, I, and, I, and I think this is interesting, that there's this paradox here where Buber is talking about, look, in actuality, the world might not actually be twofold, but to man, the world is twofold. And, and I think it's um, within this very... Um, you could say this non-actuality or this sort of non the way it actually is that Buber is not trying to pay attention to. He's saying to man, this is how it, this is how it seems to him. And we can only ever pay attention to how it seems um, rather than what it actually is. Because I think the danger of when we start talking about, well, that's not actually how it is. We can only ever go into the realm of abstraction when we start talking about how it actually is. Buber, in my opinion, Buber is really trying to ground us in how things are as they present themselves, right? So that's why he says, to man, the world is twofold. You can already hear the subjectivity in that line. And then he follows it up with, in accordance with his twofold attitude. Um. And, and now, and I think also the, the, the accusation that Buber is sort of being reduced to sort of dichotomizing in terms of an I it and an I thou, again, I think it's a really false um, notion because Buber is trying to emphasize relation. And what is relation? Relation is always two, right? But if you just, I'm just gonna let you guys hear the repetition and hear the rhythm, and then you're going to see something really interesting with what Buber's doing. All right, so here, I'm going to finish the whole paragraph at least, and then we're going to unpack it. So, okay, to man, the world is twofold. 
in accordance with his twofold attitude. The attitude of man is twofold in accordance with the twofold nature of the primary words which he speaks. The primary words are not isolated words, but combined words. The one primary word is the combination I thou. The other primary word is the combination I it, wherein without a change in the primary word, one of the words he and she can replace it. Hence, the eye of man is also twofold. For the eye of the primary word, I thou, is a different I from that of the primary word, I it. Um, so here, okay, pay attention to how many times Buber says twofold, right? The world is twofold, right? That's the first one. In accordance with his twofold attitude, and that's another twofold. Then we have the twofold nature of the primary words. Then we have the twofold I, right? So this idea that Buber is simply reducing everything to a dichotomy, I don't think that criticism is actually having any is not having any real weight about what Buber is trying to express here. Buber is trying to express this movement of actual experience, right? Um, and and to give you an example of this repetition of twofold, think of a think of a shooting, uh, think of like a grain shooting up, right? A stalk of grain shooting up, and how it goes like this, right? This is how Buber's saying, look, the twofold world, the twofold um, nature, the twofold I, right? It is like this constant folding, this two-folding that is going on, right? It's not a static dichotomy of that we can just say, oh, there's this I it, there's this I thou, even though that's the only way Buber can express it. But right here in the very beginning, Buber is already exposing this movement and this repetition of relation um, of how the twofold is going, right? There's just like, think of like when you open something, it's twofold. And then when you try to open it again, it's twofold. And then when you try to open it again, it's twofold. Like Buber is literally doing this cracking open of a piece of fruit here of saying how we look at reality. And how reality is, right? It's this constant unfolding. Um, but the thing is that this constant unfolding, this repetition of unfolding, this is for Buber the the meeting, right? The 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 meeting itself. This is relation. This is what it means to have relation. Um, and to have intimate contact with something is always an exclusive relationship, right? So in that sense, if we take seriously what Buber is saying, we can't reduce what Buber is saying to a dichotomy. Buber is actually thinking reality, right? He's trying to think how things actually are the way we are behaving, Um and so this, I mean, and, and I think this is a problem when we read Buber is that we try to read Buber in this uh, abstraction realm, and I got caught into this too. But again, if you want to have a relation with something, there is always this twofoldness going on, and it's always exclusionary, right? Um, so let's let's continue on, right? Uh, Buber then follows. He says, primary words do not signify things, but they are intimate relations. Right? He says, primary words do not describe something that might exist independently of them, but being spoken, they bring about existence. Now, you see, like, it's funny because I can't help but think of Lacan here, right? Where we start talking about the signifier and everything. Buber, 
words, this, these primary words, the I and the Tao, it's all relation for Bupert, right? There isn't, you could say the mistake, right? The mistake of the subject is that the subject thinks it's separate. <laughs> like that is the paradox of the subject, that the, that the subject believes itself to be separate. Um, but actually every time you say I, you are in combination with. The I is along with. Um, we can start, a, I think Heidegger starts kind of thinking this way when he starts saying, you know, being along with, being in the world, like there is no, it's a, it's a false idea to think there is separation. In fact, you're already in relation. The only non-relation is that you, you're not, act, the only non-relation that exists is the fact that you don't believe or not behaving in the fact that there is a relation, that there is already a relation. Um, and, and so people already come across these paradoxes all the time. Um, they're trying to solve the non-relation, but the thing is there is no solving of the non-relation. There's just already relation. Um, the non-relation is believing that we are already separate somehow. Um, and I think Buber is sort of emphasizing this. Okay, so to finish to finish this on, right? He says primary words are spoken from the being. If thou is said, the I of the combination I thou is said along with it. If it is said, the I of the combination I it is said along with it. Okay, so Basically, I mean, I, I guess the, the, I could I could explain this in a way that is Jungian that would kind of make sense for people that have read Jung. And, and this is how I'm going to make sense of it, right? Jung talks about how you have like a shadow, right? And any time that you have like a sort of like a disgust towards another person, what Jung would say is actually your disgust is not necessarily that other person. It could be, but... Um, your disgust is actually a reflection of your own self that you already have within you, right? Buber is doing this with language. Um, but in my opinion, he's also doing this kind of like with consciousness in a way where you encounter another, right? Maybe an it or an a thou. But the, the problem that you don't, the thing that we don't see is that when I say I, I am saying you along with it. And when I am saying you, I am saying I along with it. Most of the time we don't think that way. We think in terms of like this, there's this separation, there's this dichotomy between I and you, um, the I a subject and object, right? Buber, Buber's breaking this idea. He's literally cracking open this idea and saying, look, it's a relation. You can't, it's, it's kind of like you're incorrect to think there is separation. There's only combination. I think that's what Buber would say. There is only combination. And that your I, the I that you posit, can't be by itself. It's always with another. It's always already been <laughs> with another. And I think that's exactly what Buber is trying to say here. Right. Um, so the, and then this will kind of go into like um, the last part of it or the some of the last part of it where he says this. Um, the primary word I thou can only be spoken with the whole being. OK. The primary word I it can never be spoken with whole being. OK, so to build up. To build up on what we've already said, remember, Buber is thinking combination. So what does it mean to speak with your whole being? Speaking with your whole being is that realization that the I can never be by itself. The I is always in combination with. And once you realize that the I is within combination with, 
only that is only when you can speak with whole being, right? Because the whole being, and I think, I mean, maybe this is reading into it, right? Maybe this is reading into it, but I actually think this might be true for Buber. To speak with the I thou is actually to speak whole being, right? Um, to realize that the I is never by itself, but always along with is the only way to speak with whole being, right? Now, this has implications. What, what does it mean about whole being? Well, um, it depends like how abstractly we want to go, how deep we want to go into this. I mean, it, there there is this tendency that we could say, actually, every time philosophy has talked about being, they have only ever talked about partial being, right? And that they've been constantly trying to solve partial being. That means they've been trying like, They've been trying to solve something that is an I-it relationship. And so that means it's never a whole being. And that means if we were to go back to Heidegger, when Heidegger is saying, hey, no, none of us has been able to answer what the meaning of being is, well, uh, there is a problem in the fact that maybe we've never matured, not, we haven't gone through the journey to actually understand what whole being you know, how can we reach whole being so that way we can understand what the meaning of being is, right? And in a sense, it's like this. We're trying to answer what meaning of being is when we are in a partial relation as partial being. Um, and, and that might actually be the the failure, right? That that That, I mean, again, this is just kind of me reading into it at that point. Um, but you see here that we have to think combination. The I can never. So, so the question remains, you know, we could say, well, how does the I develop? Well, the I can only, the I can't develop by itself. The I is always I thou. It's always combination with. Um, now we could go into like what Daniel and, and Trey, I think we have talked about in the previous videos where um, we, we could go into like this I, you know, I suchness or I it or ego it, <laughs> um, where again, this twofold um, obstacle kind of going in to develop the I vow. And then so the last part of this, and, I, and I'll just read it. He says, there is no I taken in itself, but only the I of the primary word, I thou. And the I of the primary word, I it. When a man says I, he refers to one or other of these. The I to which he refers is present when he says I. Further, when he says thou or it, the I of one of the two primary words is present. The existence of I and the speaking of I are one and the same thing. When a primary word is spoken, the speaker enters the word and takes his stand in it. Um, this this taking stand in the the, the you know when the primary word is spoken and the speaker enters the word and takes a stand in it this is actually very reminiscent of when Heidegger in his later thinking and his turning uh, how people call it when he says that being like the language is the house of being right this this is kind of what it reminds me of when Buber is saying this but notice how We've already reached that point, right? Of realizing realizing that the I can never be taken in itself. Right? Now, um, earlier I had a, you know, I, I joined Daniel's the net, um, and we were talking about, you know, how do we escape? Um, you know, how, how do we prevent ourselves from being captured? Um See, the, the, the funny thing about the, the Lucian thing is, right, to be so neurotic that you can't get caught, captured or so pathological that you can't get captured and so on. But really, I think Buber, the way Buber is exposing how we don't get captured, 
is by this simple realization that it's not how you notice like the trap here. It's a very, it's a very easy trap to get caught into, right? You say, how do I not get captured? It's really, how do, how does I, you not get captured? But once you realize that the eye is not separated, you escape the capture, so to speak. Um, but really, again, it's not really like the escaping of the capture. It's more like you sort of do this turning where it's no longer like an emphasis of escaping. Um, okay. And and the other thing, and, and so again, Buber is really like pinning this down, right? He's, he's saying, look, there's no difference between me speaking the I and me speaking and, and the existence of I. And this is, I mean, to me, this is like the most tangible experience you can have, right? And what does this mean? Okay. So he's saying that there's no difference between existence of I and the speaking of I because they're the same in the one thing, right? Okay, but think think about this. Think about how it's actually working. I say I, you say I, right? I exist, you exist, we both say I. Notice how we both say I. The existence and the speaking are the same thing. But the problem is, if we realize that the I is just separate, then we have problems. But if the I is always in relation with and never in itself, then we get an I you, an I it. Buber is saying actually this is always happening. Because the moment you say I, you are always actually pointing to another. You're pointing to another that is not I. The moment, and I think that's this is a very interesting thing to think about. The moment I posit I, I am also positing not I. Now, the and I, and I think this is super, <laughs> again, super fascinating is that now, now this is the problem. If every time I say I and I'm positing not I, and every time I am living in I, I'm also positing the living of not I, now the problem is, is exactly what Buber is going to slowly get into is how do we have a relation with the not I. And, and and some of you listening to this, you would say, okay, how do we have a relation with the other? That is really the problem. How do we have a relation to the other? And this is what Buber is going to try to um, answer is how do we have a relation to the other? Um, because we're always having a relation to the other. And actually that's probably the first um, step is realizing that we are always having a relation to the other. Even if it is a non non-relation to the other we're always having a relation in some ways um so the moment i posit i i'm positing a not i by saying everything else is not i <laughs> um and, and and this this is what i like about um uh this way and, and again the last line here that I, that I think is just so so beautiful because it really i feel like boober is really trying to get at real lived and I, and I I think I want to make a distinction between what we might call theoretically like what is reality and then what is actuality it, it, I, I want to say Buber is not so much entertained about the abstract notions of what is reality I think Buber is trying to emphasize look this is our actuality this is what is actually happening, right? And then if we were to go back again to the first line where he says, to man, the world is twofold. Um, this is actuality rather than reality. And I, and I think maybe the, 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 the sin of the, the emphasis is that every time we talk about reality, we want to talk about actuality. But maybe it's, it's, imp maybe it's time that we start distinguishing 
the difference between reality and actuality. Um, and Buber, I think, in my opinion, is really nailing this on the head. That it's like, okay, look, maybe like it's not a concern to him necessarily what we can theoretically abstract as the reality, but this is actuality. And the moment I say something, the moment I say I, I'm already standing in being. I'm already standing as an I in relation to another. Whether I believe or not, whether I realize that or not, I'm always standing in that relation. The moment it is spoken, the moment that I am living in being, I am speaking I, I it, or I thou. Um, So I think, um, yeah, I think that's a, that's enough for today. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I want to make this like a daily thing. Uh, I, I enjoyed it, but I feel like the moment I say that I'm going to do this as a daily thing, then it won't happen anymore. So um, I might leave it more in the open for you guys, but I, I really enjoyed it. Um, Maybe we need to start thinking, you know, just some of my thoughts afterwards. Maybe we need to start thinking combination rather than um, separation. Uh, this is, I think, Buber's proposal, right? Why think separation when you, when you can think combination? Um, I, you know, I, thou, I, it. And I think, again, to sort of emphasize the, the critique against Buber as kind of reducing everything to some dichotomy I, I, I don't think that it's necessarily thinking through what Buber is saying. It's it's abstractly a dichotomy, but I think what Buber is pointing to is actual lived relation. A relation with something or another being is always two. Um, it's always two. Um, so, and the I if we were to take anything out of this, is that the I itself cannot exist on its own. It's always in combination with. It's very similar, in my opinion, to maybe Heidegger's notion of being with and being, being already being in the world, right? Being in the world is like you already are in combination with. Now the, the task at hand is that how do I have a relation with this other that I don't even recognize? Right, this other is so unrecognizable that I believe myself to be separate. Right, that's the problem. Um, that, you know, hopefully Boober begins to answer. But you already can tell that Boober is answering this by saying, "Look, once you realize that this combination exists, that the I itself cannot be posited without it being in combination with I it or I thou, then, um, you know, we, we start. We already get ourselves out of that." that trouble, that, that, that anxiety of being the sort of self-existing, self-positing I that is separated um, when really there is the, and also it's very interesting that Buber calls it the primary word, right? Notice how he goes, it's a unit, primary word, and it's I thou, right? Um, so there is this like, to unfolding suchness that is going on. Like if you just keep peeling away at a um, banana peel, or if you just kept like unboxing a, a Russian doll like this and this and this and this, um, you would just see twofoldness, 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 twofoldness. Um, it's in that twofoldness that Buber is talking about that we have the chance of meeting, that everything is meeting. Everything is meeting. Um, which I, I mean, personally, I, I think it's a really beautiful concept. Um, and, I, and I do think it's actuality rather than reality. I think when we, once we start talking about reality, um, we start getting into the realm of abstraction about the way things are. We, we get into um, the capture of certainty once we start trying to theorize how reality is. Um, and I think, and again, this is just strictly my interpretation of Buber. Buber is doing this implicit splitting and separating away from actuality and reality. He's trying to say, look, let's not get into abstract notions 
of reality. Let's just get into actuality, right? And the paradox is that the actuality is always going to be our reality anyways. But for Buber, to, in, in order to sort of keep the movement of actuality going on, is that there's always this twofoldness. There's always this meeting. So that means that you can never be um, certain of something because everything is always meeting. And when you're always meeting something, something else is always coming up, arising, a new, maybe a new certainty. But I would, I would refrain from ha saying new certainty. I would just say it's just another meeting. Um, but yeah, I think that's it for um, just the the first page. I mean, I did a little bit of the back page, but it's not like half. Um, but yeah, uh, that's kind of like my third encounter with Boober. Um, I hope you guys liked it. Um, I, I've been really loving I and Thou. I think there's a lot to extract from it. I think there's a lot to learn from it. Um, it was an inspirational piece of work from Boober. So um, maybe I, I, I actually entertained the possibility that even because it was an inspirational work by Boober, it's possible that Boober may not have even actually um, fully um, acknowledged those ideas. Um, so I, I think relooking Boober is very important and, and to kind of extrapolate his inspiration um, and, and maybe even do like a creative, um, <laughs> I don't want to say misreading, but um, a creative misreading of Boober in the sense of, you know, trying to get at the, as much as we can, of the essence of I and thou. And I, I, and I think, Again, the way I'm reading Boober is Boober is trying to talk about actual lived relation. And if we're trying to do philosophy with Boober, we have to think actual lived relation. I, and I think, in my opinion, that is being loyal to his thinking, right? Getting into his thinking is thinking actual lived relation. Um, if we start thinking Boober and throwing him in abstract realms. Um, yeah, Boober's gonna be wrong. Boober is gonna be um, maybe even useless um, or maybe even only a tool. Um, but Boober as lived relation, um, as this aiming towards a meeting, which is again, a very beautiful concept in my opinion. Um, I think you start slowly capturing the essence of what he's saying. Um, so, yeah. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I might do more of these. I don't know. I don't want to pin myself down to it because I notice the moment I pin myself down to it, then I have to commit. And the moment I commit to it, it also dies. So let's leave it sporadically. Um, and if people enjoy it, I mean... I, if people enjoy it, that's nice, but I enjoy talking about it. I enjoy um, extrapolating for, you know, from just a single page for like, you know, uh, 30 minutes or an hour or, you know, however long I can do it, think about it. So, all right. Hope you guys take care. Hope you guys enjoyed it. All right. Bye.